Hey, this is Eric and welcome to this session on Google Sheets activities for all subjects. Before we get started, I want to make sure you can access all of the resources for this session. Uh, the easiest way to do that is through the bit.ly link that you see on the screen here. Uh, that would be bit dot lee slash kurtz dash sheets and if you follow that link that will take you out to a google document that looks like this uh, this has all of the resources that we're going to be exploring throughout the session uh, with links to take you out to templates uh, that you can make copies of or blog posts with additional information or links out to websites with uh, more resources so lots and lots and lots of resources in that particular document um, you certainly are allowed to um, make a copy of this document if you would like no problem at all just click on the file menu and say make a copy um, or if you'd like you can simply just bookmark it uh, add it to your bookmarks or you can add it to your Google Drive easiest way to do that is if you go to the right of the title, you'll see a little icon that says Add Shortcut to Drive. That way you'll always have an easy way to get back uh, to this document as I do add new resources into it from time to time. Again, that link is bit.ly slash Kurtz dash sheets and that'll get you into that Google document. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be taking a look at uh, in this session. Basically the idea behind this session is uh, ideas for how to use Google Sheets um, in your class for student activities and there's quite a lot of possibilities here we're going to be taking a look at things like analyzing data learning databases educational games random generator activities art activities task check checklists uh, conditional feedback uh, and more, much more um, those do go in order here in the document so I'm basically just gonna be working right down through this uh, Google document here as we work down through each of these different uh, learning activities. Now for this particular session you don't need anything uh, special just a, a regular Google account it could be a school account or a personal account and of course access to Google Sheets this is an introductory session so you don't need any prior knowledge on using Google Sheets we will get into some deeper things and uh, you know formulas and stuff like that as we work through this but you certainly don't have to have any prior experience uh, to take advantage of these uh, activities we're going to be taking a look at all right, and I think that's it. So we're going to go ahead and dive into our first uh, topic here, which is using Google Sheets um, for your students to analyze data in your class. Now, this is probably one of the most commonly things we common things we think of when we think of using a spreadsheet. We think about it for analyzing data, and that is a wonderful use for it. So we'll we'll start with this. We'll start with the most common use. Uh, so the idea is that uh, your students can use Google Sheets to collect data and to analyze that data in a lot of ways um, and it can be you know data specific to uh, what they're learning in class now this data can come from a lot of stuff it could be that they're you know creating a Google form and it's a survey that they're sending out to other students or to you know maybe another school in some other state or country or um, and then collecting data from the Google form putting that into a sheet and analyzing that you know or it could be uh, public data sets there's a lot of, of and I've got links in the agenda here to some great uh, sources for public data sets there's a lot of great data online that uh, could be pulled into a Google sheet and analyzed as well or students could be you know pulling in information from lots of other things real life measurements probes and sensors and so forth um, what we're gonna do in our example here is uh, we're going to go ahead and go with a, a real simple one I set up here where I have a Google form that is set up to collect just some some very simple data just so we have something to work for at, work with as an example and then a Google sheet that that data goes into and we'll just take it for a spin and show some different things you can do with it this is not the example I'm showing here is is not subject specific or grade level specific it's really just meant to show you the mechanics of how the data could be collected and one 
once you have it in a sheet, what you can do with it. As far as you know, you using this in your subject area, again, that's really going to depend upon what is the data that you would like your students to explore. Again, whether it's a form they've created or using some of the awesome public data sets out there like Data is Plural or Our World in Data, Data USA, Google's Data Set Search, Found uh, Data, Kaggle, all of these websites are great places to go out and uh, access data as well. I've also got some specifically math related here. A great website called What If. Uh, the What If Math website has a lot of um, spreadsheets already created with uh, data that can be explored. Um, for our example though, like I said, we're going to be using a Google form and that is right. And you can try this out as well. All these links here uh, are available for you to explore as well. So uh, in this example, I'm going to click first of all on the sample data collection form. And this is just a, a, a regular Google form. Nothing too fancy about this one here. Uh, just using it as an example to show, you know, how this could be used as like a survey or something like that to collect data uh, for the class. In this case, I'm just asking some demographic information here, uh, like, you know, what type of community do you live in? And, you know, what's your age? How many siblings do you have? How many pets do you have? What's your height? How many letters in your first name? And what month were you born in numerically, 1 through 12? Uh, so, you know, very straightforward stuff just so we can see the mechanics of how this works. Now, with a Google form, when somebody fills out a Google form, the information from that form can then be sent into a Google Sheet, and that is what this other link is here. Uh, that's really easy to do. Uh, for example, if I go into edit mode on this form here, and I go to the response responses tab in edit mode, there's a little button in the top right that says view responses in sheets. That's what will link your Google form over to a Google sheet. Now again, you don't have to use a Google form at all. The students could just be putting the data directly into a Google sheet, or again, you could be pulling the data from a public data set or from some other source like that. In this case though, we were using the Google form and then sending it over to the Google sheet. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and click on the link here that says Google Sheet link next to Sample Data Collection Sheet. And I would encourage you to do the same thing. This will give you a copy of this data as it currently exists. So we'll go ahead and give a click on that. It'll say, would you like a copy? I'll go, yep, I would. And just give that a moment to make a copy. I think there's at least as the time of this recording, there's well over 600 entries in this. I've used this with various uh, trainings and so People have been kind enough to fill this out. Uh, and, and so we've got a lot of data in here that we can explore. I think, again, like I said, a little over 600 entries. And this will give you your own copy of this spreadsheet so you can play along and try some of these things out. All right. So now that we have some data, and again, this is just a you know kind of placeholder data. You know, you would of course have data that is more relevant <laughs> to the grade level and subject area that you are uh, teaching with your students. But let's just run through what are some things we could do with the data now that we've got it. And tell you what, I'll zoom in just a little bit on this data so we can just see it a little bit better there. Um, let's start off with really basic things, and we'll just kind of work our way up to some you know more advanced things we can do when it comes to analyzing data. And the real key to analyzing data is asking questions. That's really what it's about. It's not just about collecting data. It's about getting our students to wonder, you know, what if or why or what's the connection or making predictions. You know, those are the higher level thinking skills we're wanting to, you know, move them toward is looking at the data and drawing conclusions and making predictions from it. Um, so in a case like this, you know, let's begin with something really simple. So uh, like a real simple question might be, huh, I wonder out of all these people here, uh, what's the, you know, what's the tallest person? <laughs> you know, what's what's the highest height of, of the people that we have here? Now to solve a question like that, sure. I mean, I could scroll down through here and keep looking and try to see what's the biggest number I see there. Uh, but certainly the best, uh, the quickest option would just be to use the sort feature that's built right into Google Sheets. Now to do sorting, uh, very simple. If you're sorting by one criteria, we simply click somewhere in the column that we want to sort by and then go up to our data menu and you'll see sort sheet is one of the options right there in the data menu and you can sort the entire sheet by that specific column either you know a to z or z to a low to high or high to low so let's just go high to low from you know z to a so if i click on that 
Suddenly it resorts the entire sheet and we'll notice, yep, we've got somebody who's 82 inches tall. That is, uh, that is our highest height. And of course, if I scroll all the way down to the bottom, looks like 52 inches is our, is our shortest height that has been uh, submitted here. Now we could do a little bit more sophisticated sort than that. I mean, it could be something where you're saying, hmm, I'm wondering, you know, of all of the people here, uh, what if we said we just are curious about folks who identified as uh, living in a rural community? Who's the tallest person in a rural community? Well, we could do a multi-level sort. Um, now, to do that, since we're sorting by two things, we want to sort by their community and sort by their height, we can't just unfortunately click in one column and just boom, do it with one button. Instead, what we want to do is select all of the data and do a multi-level sort, a multi-criteria sort. To do that, we want to start by clicking in the top left-hand corner between column A and row one, where this blank square is with this blank rectangle, because when I click there, it selects everything. And that's important because we don't want to accidentally just sort part of the sheet and not all of it and get our data disconnected. So I'm going to click there and select everything, go back up to that data menu. But instead of doing sort sheet, this time I'm going to choose sort range and I'm going to choose the advanced range sorting options. When I choose that, what it does is it brings up this nice pop up window where I can say, OK, yep, my data has a header row and I want to sort by multiple things. Let's say I want to first sort by the community that people live in. Awesome. And then I want to add another sort of sorting column and let's now sort by their height. And again, we'll do, you know, Z to A as an example. So we're doing a, and we can keep adding as many as well, but we're doing a multi-criteria sort first by community and then by their height. When I hit the sort button, we should now see a result here where we've got all of the rural people first, and then we should be getting our suburban and then our urban after that. But then within each one of these categories we've also now sorted by height so yep 82 is the highest height for somebody in the rural uh, communities now in addition to doing it as a sort there are other ways we could have approached this we could have also used what's called filtering so if you're not familiar with filtering let me go ahead and I'll just resort all this by uh, uh, the timestamp. So it goes back to the way it was initially, and then we'll kind of start from scratch on that. Um, filtering is another cool option, which allows you to hide data that doesn't meet the criteria you're looking for. So if you've got a lot of data, you just want to narrow in on the data that you're interested in. Filtering is a great tool for that. To do that, we can either click on the filter button that you see here in the toolbar, or if I go over to the data menu, I can choose create a filter. And when I do that, I now get these little drop down menus at the top of each of my columns that allows me to filter and say, I only want to view data that fits a certain criteria. So for example, under community, I could say, okay, I got rural, suburban, and urban. Let's uncheck, you know, some of these. Uh, we'll do something different this time. Let's, let's, uh, let's just say we want to look at the suburban folks. So I could uncheck rural and urban and just leave suburban checked. And when I hit okay, it temporarily hides everything except for the folks who identified their community as being suburban. And so now I've narrowed this down to something smaller. Well, I could do another filter on top of that. You can stack the filters. So like I could come over here, uh, you know, let's say we want to look at, okay, you know, what are, you know, what are the heights, you know, why, you know, again, heights is just an example, but you know, what are the heights of people who are, you know, suburban and let's say older than 50. Let's, let's do an additional filter on top of this. So I could come here to the age column and I could click on the uh, filter button and I could uncheck every single age except those above 50, you know, if I wanted to go through, but with a lot of data, that's a lot. So there's a couple ways to filter. Instead of filtering by values, you can also filter by condition. So what I could do is simply click on filter by condition and I could put in a rule and say, let's do this. Let's filter such that I only want to see cells that match a certain criteria, like, you know, the text contains a certain, you know, word, or it's a date that's before or after a certain date, or it's a number that falls within a range, which I think is what I want to do. I want to say, I'm looking for any numbers in the age column that are greater than or equal to a certain value. So I'll choose greater than or equal to, and I'll type in the value. I'll say it's 50. So now I've created a condition, and when I hit OK, it should only be showing me people whose ages are 50 or greater. Let's hit OK and see. 
And look at that. Now we've, you know, we've reduced it down to suburban folks and now we've uh, filtered it down to whose ages are uh, 50 and above. And of course, at this point, I could come over here and I could, you know, if I still was actually looking at height or whatever the case was, I could, of course, come in here and I could sort, you know, now by that column. And uh, of the suburban folks, 50 and above, it looks like 76 inches is our, you know, biggest height. You get the idea. So um, when you're all done, you can very easily unfilter by either clicking the filter button again and then coming in and removing your conditions or selecting all. Uh, probably the easiest thing though is just to click the filter button on the toolbar or in the data menu. Just say remove filter and boop, it'll take it off and we're right back to where we began. Now we have all of our data there again. Now let's go deeper. Those are pretty pretty simple you know sorting filtering that's good stuff to know and you can answer some simple questions with that but maybe not some of the more advanced things that we're really trying to get into here like what about relationships between things i would be curious for example to explore the age of people and how many siblings they have now what is there a connection between there i guess is what i'm saying and here's what i'm thinking uh we tend to wonder you know if the american family is getting smaller over time are people you know having less less children or families you know get, get getting smaller over time so this would be an interesting thing we could look at if people who are older do they tend to have more siblings because they were born at a time, you know, when we were having larger families and the younger ages perhaps would have less? Well, how could we how could we find that out? Well, there's a lot of options, but I think a good one would be creating a, a chart or a graph that lets us visually look at this data and see if there seems to be a relationship there. So to do that, what I would do is I would select these two columns, age and siblings. So in this case, I'll just take my mouse, click and drag and I'll grab both of those columns and with those selected I'll now create a chart based off of age and siblings so to do this we're going to go up to the insert menu and choose chart from that drop down and Google will try to create a chart probably not one that we you know want initially it just kind of you know tries to pick what it thinks we want there in this case a bar graph is not going to be uh, very helpful for us but thankfully over on the right hand side we get the chart editor where we can go in and, uh, and modify this in a lot of ways, and cho including choosing the type of chart we want to create. So here where it says column chart, instead of that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a scatter plot because a scatter plot will create a point uh, for every entry where the coordinates are the person's age and how many siblings they have. So let's turn this into a scatter chart and suddenly already that's a lot clearer. <laughs> so we can see everybody's ages and how many siblings they have. Now, um, you know, it does look like, just looking at this, I believe it feels like the older people are. It seems like we're getting more siblings. So I think I'm seeing that, but we could go a little deeper. We could add a trend line to see if that really is the case or not. So if I go into my chart editor again here on the right and I go into the customize section, for example, I could expand the series option. And under the series option, there's a lot of things there, but one of them is trend line. And if I click on that, it generates a mathematical trend line. And pff, yep, absolutely. We can now really see that we can see that um, it is rising to the right here that uh, the higher age the uh, in general the more siblings so apparently the larger uh, the families are now for what it's worth when you do get a chart like this, just for clarification, uh, Google will a lot of times just drop it <laughs> right on top of your data, and that can be a little bit confusing. You are allowed to click on it and move it around. I find, though, a lot of times an easier thing to do is to click on the three dots button in the right corner, top right corner of it, and choose the option Move to Own Sheet, because what that'll do is put it on its own tab. So if I click Move to Own Sheet, now you'll see I have my original tab with all my data, and now I have a tab called Chart 1 where I can see that data a lot easier. All right, um, what else could we do with data? Just a couple more things, and then we will move on to other activities. Um, uh, another common thing might be to uh, calculate 
averages or minimums or maximums. So talking about formulas, um, let's say we wanted to, you know, put a row across the top where we calculated the average age, average siblings, average pets, and so forth. So what I could do, for example, is I could choose um, one of these rows, like row two, give it a right click and say, insert a row above. So now I get a row above that. And by the way, if for this average row, if I don't want it to move with the rest of the data, I can drag this thick gray bar, the freeze bar down, so I can freeze that row along with the headers there. That sometimes is a little bit easier. And I could just type in something like, you know, averages here. And then what I'd want to do is put in some formulas here that would average all of the data below here and let me know, like, what is the average age of everybody who has uh, replied to this? Um, to do a formula, um, and again, this can be really basic. You can get <laughs> way, way more involved with formulas. Uh, but in general, just as a simple introduction, uh, you can create a formula pretty easily. What you do is you press the equals key on your keyboard to begin creating a formula. Let's the sheet know, hey, I'm going to do a formula. And then you can just start typing in the, uh, for the function you want. And there are hundreds and hundreds hundreds of pre-built functions. So if, for example, if I started typing in the word average, you'll see it's popping up all of these different functions that, you know, deal with average. Um, and in this case, I just want the normal numerical average. And then it wants to know what cells I want to average up. And you can always expand this out to read more about how these formulas work. In general, the idea is you would type in the first cell, a colon, and the last cell. And the cells are named by column and row. So like, you know, C3 would be the cell right below here. And then it's suggesting that I go down to C613 since that's the last cell in here. And I certainly could do that. I could say, let's go from C3 down to, you know, C613, if, that, if that's how far I wanted to go down. Or a neat thing you can actually do is you don't even have to put the end on. You can just close it out with a parenthesis. And if I do that, it's saying start at C3 and just go to the bottom. So if let's say, you know, a month from now, there's 200 more entries, no problem because this formula would go all the way down to the bottom of the column. And that's it. That's the formula. Go ahead and press enter and it will calculate that average there. Um, if I want to, I can adjust how many you know decimal places are showing there. I can use the format buttons at the top to increase or decrease the number of decimal places. And then I could use that same formula on the other columns. I don't even have to recreate it. I can just click on the cell, grab this little blue square in the bottom right corner, and then drag the formula to the right, and it will update that formula as we go. It'll now average in the D column and the E column and so forth. So it's really great, uh, really helpful to be able to do that. And you could do the same thing with lots of other formulas. If you go to the help menu and you go to function list, this will bring up a page where you can explore the literally hundreds of formulas that Google Sheets uh, provides. There are a lot of those. All right, last thing I promise on data analysis and we'll move on to some other, uh, some other uh, things we can do with Google Sheets. Uh, but for those who really want to go into the deep end of the pool, we'll do one more quick example here. And um, it's something called pivot tables. And it sounds a little intimidating, but it's such a wonderful tool once you learn how it works. And pivot tables um, are a special tool in Google Sheets that helps you do um, more su summarization of data by category. So let's say I now wanted to ask a question like, huh, I wonder if people who live in a rural area have more pets than people who live in a suburban area versus an urban area. Now, I'm getting an average here for pets, but it's all of them. It's it's every there's 1.7 pets on average, but it's not broken down by urban, rural and suburban. So how would we do that? Well, a great way to do that is through what's called a pivot table. And so the way that works is we would select all the data like we've done before. And then we'll uh, go, let me find my pivot table now. We've uh, moved things around a little bit here. Oh, there it is under insert. Uh, if I go to the insert menu, there it is. Under insert, there's pivot table. So I'll click insert pivot table and ask if I want to create a new sheet. I'll go, yep, I do. And on this new tab, this is where we'll now build our pivot table. And the way it works is we'll add in the rows, columns, and values that we want to summarize. So for rows, the first thing over here that I want to do is I want to decide 
what you know what are the rows that I want to summarize up and what we're saying is we want to summarize up the different communities we want to see the average amount of pets for each of the different communities so my rows should list suburban urban and rural so if I go to rows and I say add community boom it automatically looks through my data and it finds all the unique values and there they are rural suburban and urban no problem now what do I want it to calculate well that's going to be my values and so for my values i want it to summarize the pets so for values i'm going to say let's add pets now when i do it's not going to show exactly what i want right away but we can fix it pretty quickly what it's doing is it's counting through all of the entries for rural suburban and urban and it's summing them up it's adding them together and that's not what i wanted i didn't want it to add them together but that's no problem i can come here to the summarize option and i can say instead of summing them let's average them and when I click average, it does a new summarization where now there we go. And of course, I can adjust the uh, uh, just the decimal points if we don't need, you know, quite quite so many there. Uh, but you can see really quick that, well, look at that. Yeah. So there are two point on average, 2.1 pets for people that uh, live in a rural community, 1.6 for suburban and 1.2 for urban. And that's so easy to do with something like a pivot table. And so that's again. Crash course, I know. That's a lot of stuff thrown at you there all at once, but hopefully that gives you just a couple of ideas that if you have data in a spreadsheet, it can be as simple as sorting the data. It can be as simple as filtering it, or it can be a little more sophisticated. We can be making charts and graphs. We can be uh, adding functions and formulas. We can be making pivot tables. It all comes down to asking questions and then investigating the data, drawing conclusions, and making predictions from it. All right, well, let's keep on moving and talk about other things we can do with Google Sheets besides the most common, which is, you know, analyzing data. Uh, and so for the next thing we're going to take a look at is something that's, I feel it's got a lot of similarities, but it's different enough that I've broken it out a little separately. And that's something I'm calling learning databases. Now, okay, what do I mean by that? So with a learning database, what I'm talking about is when students are learning new content, one thing they could do is they could create a spreadsheet where they enter in the information they're learning um, and build a learning database based on that information. In this example you see here, um, it's animals so like maybe this is an elementary science class or something like that just in this example here where each student is assigned a different animal and they need to um, you know research that animal and then they go into the spreadsheet and they type in information based upon what as a class you've agreed upon that we need to find out about each animal now it doesn't have to be animals obviously it could be you know characters from a novel or careers they're exploring or countries of the world explorers elements of the periodic table on and on on and on down the line. Um, I've got a couple examples in here that you can explore under learning databases. There's the animals one that we just were talking about there a moment ago. And so this just has a whole bunch of whole bunch of animals uh, in there. But then I've got other ones like um, here's one for characters from 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 a novel. So this is the book Wonder. Um, if I click on this sheet uh, link, it'll give you a copy of this uh, spreadsheet here. Give that a moment to pop up. And this is one where it's the book Wonder, which you might be familiar with. It's about um, a fifth grade boy who was born with severe facial deformities and he's had all these surgeries and he's going to school for the first time, you know, with, with other students. And it's a very moving story about, you know, him dealing with that and the people he meets and how they deal with him and, and so forth. And in this case, it's a spreadsheet but there's really not numbers in it. So it's, you know, that's why I'm calling it a learning database. It's just information where in this case, each row is a different character in the book. So as the student is reading the story and they come across a new character, they add them to the spreadsheet and then little by little, they fill in information about that character. Or again, you know, it could be like animals or, you know, whatever the case might be. Now, just collecting that information is nice. It's cool to have it all in one place, but the power again comes in when we talk about using things like sorting and filtering to then 
answer questions based on that data. So we don't stop just by collecting the data. We now go deeper and say something like, okay, so what could we, what could we ask here? Well, one of the key things in this novel was how the characters treat the main uh, character, um, Augie, who's, who's the, the main character of the story. How do the other characters treat him? So we've got a column called nice and mean. So are they nice to him or are they mean to him? Well, what I could do is I could turn on filtering. So I could come in here and turn on filtering. And I could say, let's let's narrow this down. Let's look at people who are nice to Augie. So we'll uncheck everything but the yeses and are mean to Augie. So we'll uncheck everything but the yeses. And so now we've got five characters that are both. They're both nice and mean to him. Well, why is that? What's what's the reason behind that? And that can become its own, you know, um, you know, an investigation now, or we could turn this on and say, okay, let's go back to the mean <laughs> characters. Are there any mean characters who um, are adults? And yes, there is, there is one, you know, it's Mrs. Albans. And what effect does that have on her, her son and how he treats Augie? And so being able to go in and sort and filter, we can now start asking questions about the data we've collected. So that's another use of spreadsheets that's starting to veer away from the classic number crunching where instead we are collecting uh, information and then sorting and filtering it to explore and answer questions. All right, let's keep on going. Uh, next up in our list of, of ways to use spreadsheets would be educational games. Uh, now, what I mean by this would be using a spreadsheet to create some kind of a learning activity or a learning game. There's a lot of ways to do this, but by far, my favorite recommendation would be Flippity. Uh, Flippity is a totally free website that uses Google Sheets templates to create interactive educational games and all kinds of different games. Um, so let's do this. Let's head to the Flippity website. And again, all of this you can find in the agenda document. Here's the Flippity website. And again, I've got a blog post that goes along with most all of the things I've got in here. Again, check. You'll see there's typically a blog post with more details. If you want to go deeper into some of these things, then we'll even cover here in the video. But let's head out to the Flippity website. And when we get there, what you'll see is a list of all the different educational games and activities you can create with this. So we can do, uh, and these are all digital, interactive, students can play them online, that you can create these, the students can create these. It's things like, you know, digital flashcards or a Jeopardy game or a random name picker, scavenger hunts, board games, drag and drop manipulatives, timeline builders, um, you know, typing tests, uh, crossword puzzles, word searches, uh, on down the line, you know, Mad Libs, tournament brackets, all kinds of options. Now, the way this works is for each one of these, you're going to see there's a link that says demo, and that demo allows you to just just see how it works. Like if you're going, hmm, I think, you know, I'm interested in the Jeopardy game. Well, they call it a quiz show, but it's it's it's, it's a Jeopardy game. Uh, you can click on demo and it's going to pop that open and show you here's what it's going to look like when you actually play the game. So you'd say, oh, okay, we click on, you know, bees for a hundred, you know, how do bees communicate? And then we click and we get the answer. And if somebody got it right, we can give that team, you know, points for that. And then it grays it out and we keep on moving through the game. Now you may look and go, cool, that's great. I'd love to use that with my students or I'd love my students to create games because this could be a great option for a student. Maybe they want to, you know, as an assignment, take all the vocab words from a chapter and make a set of flashcards. Maybe that's, you know, how they're going to express their understanding of the information. Well, let's say we want to do our own Jeopardy game show here. Well, that's where the other button comes in that says instructions. So for each one of these, you can click on that and it's going to explain how this works. And this is where Google Sheets comes in. So what's going to happen is in the instructions, you're going to see a link that says make a copy of a template. And that's going to be the Google spreadsheet that you need to be able to make your own version of this game. So I'll go ahead and click on that and it'll say, would you like a copy of this quiz show template? I'll say, yep. And once it gets done making the copy, you'll see it's already filled in with like placeholder data, but you're going to fill in your own data 
for it um, once it does you know pop up here and each template is different so um, in this case this is going to be the jeopardy game template here that it's making a copy of um, where if i went uh, let's grab a different one just so you can see the difference like if i said oh i want to do flashcards and if i were to click on make a template of the flashcards that one's going to look different because well it's different information you know here's the the jeopardy game one where you've got you know categories then you've got for each category you've got uh your question and answer for 100 200 300 400 and 500 whereas with the flashcards, it's you know a column for side a or side one and a column for side two the front and back of the flashcards. the idea is you would now come in or your students again this everything we're looking at here in this session in this session is things that students can do they can do all of these or you you, you could as well but these are definitely things that your students could do as well um, so what we would do is come in and we would change the category to something else you know instead of you know bees you know it, it might be something like Google trivia and then we could you know put in our question what was the original name for Google Docs because it didn't used to be Google Docs. Actually, it was a different uh, product and Google bought them and changed them and turned them into Google Docs. It was actually a product called Rightly. That was the, uh, the there's a, a bunch of Google tools actually began life as something else. But what I could do is like we could go in and we could start filling in our own categories and you know questions and answers and so forth. Now, we'll pretend that you know I filled out all of this. After you've done this in the Google spreadsheet, how do you actually play the game then? How, how, how do you run it? Well, if you look at the bottom of the spreadsheet, you'll see there's a tab that says get the link here. And if I click that, that's where you get the link to be able to play the game. Now, here's the thing. You do need to do one step before that because this is your copy of the spreadsheet. It's your own personal Google Sheet. It's private to you. So Flippity can't use it until you do what it says here. It says don't forget to publish your spreadsheet first. So publishing it just means making the link publicly visible by Flippity or whoever has the link so that they can pull the data in. And so to do that, what you're going to do is you're going to click on the file menu and we do need to go to the uh, share option. We're not really going to share it with specific people. We're going to choose publish to the web. So we're not putting in anybody's individual email address here. We're just publishing it to the web. So under share, we'll choose publish to the web. And then we'll go in and we, we don't have to publish the entire thing. I think we probably could probably just publish the first tab there. Um, but we'll just go ahead and publish the whole thing because that's that's not going to hurt uh, to be able to do that. So we'll go ahead and publish that. And then once we're done with publishing it, now we can go ahead and we can click on the link that is here. And it may take it a minute. Well, it looks like it was pretty quick. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of time. So don't don't panic <laughs> if it doesn't show up right away. Uh, but it, it did. Yeah, there it is. There's our Google trivia column. And if I click on the first question, there it is. What was the original name for Google Docs? And there's the answer. So um, that's, that's the idea. And so that link now is the link you would use for people to be able to play the game. So if a student created this, they would now copy that link and provide that link as evidence of what they had uh, created. So explore Flippity. So many neat uh, tools there to create uh, educational activities and games. We could spend a lot more time going into each of these examples here, but uh, we'll continue to move on and look at some other uh, uses of sheets. And I believe I'm going to go ahead and clean out a few of my tabs here. I got a couple of of a couple of tabs open at the moment. So why don't we go ahead and close out a couple of these and then it'll be a uh, uh, little bit quicker <laughs> as I go to keep uh, working through this. Awesome. All right. So our next topic that we've got here for ways to use Google Sheets in, in your class would be what I'm calling random generator activities. Okay. So for this one, the idea behind it is that there is a function in Google Sheets called rand between that picks a random number. You give it a low and a high, and then it picks a random number within that range. Now, you get, you don't have to know this function. Just letting you know that it exists because it can be used to create a Google spreadsheet that might generate, you know, random writing prompts or random math problems or, you know, selecting random terms or people or so forth. Now, 
I've done a couple examples with this, and if you go to the agenda document, you'll see there's two here uh, that are random writing prompt generators. And so I'm going to click on both of these. There's a blog post to explain each one, but then there's a template here. So we'll click on both of these. We'll do the random writing prompt generator. We'll give a click on that and say make a copy, and then we'll do the emoji writing prompt generator. We'll click on that and make a copy of that as well. Now, what's the point behind these? Well, the idea is, let's say a student needs to write a story, or they need to write a journal entry, or write an essay, or write a poem. They're just not sure where to begin. Like, ah, I just uh, I don't have inspiration. I'm not, I'm not sure what, you know, what, what to write about. Well, these examples are using a Google spreadsheet to inspire them. So for the random uh, emoji writing prompt generator, what I've done, if you look at the bottom, you'll see the, there's these tabs. Um, there's a tab that has two emojis, three emojis, four emojis, five emojis, and then a data tab that has all of the emojis. And basically what happens here is it randomly picks emojis to display here from that data tab. I'll zoom in a little bit here. Um, and if you don't like the emojis you've got, you can always just refresh the tab. Uh, typically, Control-R. So like on a Windows or a Chromebook, Control-R. On a Mac, I guess it'd probably be Command-R. That's like recalculate. So if I go Control-R, each time I press that, I get a uh, a re-randomization. And so a student could just keep doing this until they get a set of, you know, yeah, I want to write a story about, you know, I got an envelope, a phone, and a mouse. Okay, there we go. That's <laughs> that's going to be my writing prompt or whatever the case might be. Um, and or if, if they don't want to do emojis, the other uh, one we made a copy of is the one that is just the random writing prompt generator with words. For this one, what I've done is I've got a tab at the bottom called adjectives, which has like 2,000 adjectives and a tab called nouns with like a thousand nouns in it. And then what it does is it just randomly puts those together 20 at a time. And so some of these might be silly, some might be inspiring, but there's going to probably be something interesting there that could be, hey, okay, well, I guess that's what I'm going to write a story about or a poem about. And again, we could come in here and press control R to recalculate each time and get a new set of 20. Now, if you want to change this, please feel free to. You can make a copy of this, then you could go into the adjectives and the nouns tab, and you could fill in your own. You could delete the ones I have. You could add your own words in there, uh, modify some, take some out, add some in, and then share that with the students uh, as well. Uh, so anyway, just a, kind of a fun example of how Sheets you know, very un, you know, uh, data like it's, it, we're definitely not crunching numbers here. We're, we're, we're inspiring poetry and stories by using the random feature. Uh, I do have another link here for one that's on math fluency facts. I did not create this one. This was from Dan Kaufman. He was kind enough to share this, but it does the same idea. It randomly creates math problems that a student can complete. All right. Let's keep on moving. Um, our next category here is art activities. Um, so I've got uh, two examples here, um, and these don't have to be done in an art class. Um, they, they could be done really in, in, in any class, but they're art related activities. Uh, one of them is using Google Sheets to make what's called pixel art. If you're not familiar with pixel art, that's where you create an image using a limited number of colors on a grid. Um, and it can just be for fun, it can be for art, but it could be for you know creating a map or characters from a story or investigating fractions in area and things like that. Um, normally, you could just fire up a Google spreadsheet and then use the, uh, the fill button. Here, I'll just grab our sheet from earlier here. Uh, you could, you know, just have a regular spreadsheet and just have like a blank tab, you know, where there's not, you know, anything in there. Uh, and you could use like the paint can button to, you know, fill in, you know, colors into the cells. The problem is you, you want your cells to be square, not rectangular. So you'd have to, that's yeah, okay. You could go in and change, you know, the width. And then you could use the paint can button to fill them in. To save some time though, you'll notice in the agenda, I have a link here to a pre-made 26 color pixel art template. Um, this can just save you some time if you want to do an activity like this with the students. Basically, 
This will make a copy of that uh, template. And the way the template has been set up is there's a tab that says draw that already has all of the cells as nice, happy squares. Uh, and then instead of you having to use the paint can button to fill things in, I've used something called conditional formatting. And we're going to be seeing a lot of this for the next couple of examples. So just be aware, we'll be seeing conditional formatting quite a bit. Um, and what conditional formatting is, is where you set up rules that say, if you type a certain thing in a cell, turn it a certain color, for example. So in this case, I've got rules that say if you type in letters A through Z, these are the colors you get. So for example, H makes red. So every time I type the letter H, oops, H, there we go, <laughs> type H into a cell, Oh, there you go. <laughs> Every time I type an H into a cell, it turns it red automatically. So I can just start doing that. Or let me see, uh, S would be blue, for example. The point being that it's a lot faster <laughs> than having to go up to that paint can button <clears throat> all the time to do that. Now you can do some kind of cool things with this, like you could, you know, uh, create, you know, an 8x8, eight eight, a 10x10, 10 10, or a 12x12 12 12 image, and then explore fractions like count up how much each color shows up and simplify that as a <clears throat> fraction and lowest form or explore, you know, square, you know, square units for area and so forth. So, um, and again, we'll be seeing more about conditional formatting here in just a bit uh, on some of these other examples that we look at. So that's, that's, that's a neat activity in Sheets that's more art related. I've also got another one here that I think would be very much more specifically for art classes, but uh, creating Mondrian art. Uh, Mondrian art is um, based off of uh, the work of the Dutch artist Piet Mondrian who did more of like abstract type art with rectangles um, filled in with colors and I've got a, a template where the students basically use the merge feature inside of Google Sheets to merge cells together to create their own rectangular Mondrian art. So neat way to be creative. All right next up um, we have task checklists. Okay so your students may have a lot of things they need to complete. Maybe you've got a big set of learning objectives that by the end of the semester, these are the things you need to have covered. Or maybe it's just, you know, some daily tasks they need to make sure that they're, you know, checking off. Or there's a project, maybe it's a, you know, a project that's due in a month. And here's the, the key tasks that need to be completed in there. Google Sheets can be a nice way to stay organized with that. Um, with Google Sheets, the students could have listed out their tasks and then they could check them off as they get done. Again, to save a little time, uh, we can use conditional formatting to say if you check these off, then automatically turn the row green, for example, and you know, cross off the things. Uh, so to help with this, I do have some, ex I have an example and a template here. The example has some stuff already preloaded into it. So if you click on the example um, and let it make a copy of that, you'll see this is one where I was saying, oh, let's say it's a computer apps class. And you know, these are all of the objectives the student needs to be able to complete during the class. Well, as they complete them, if they check the box over here, it automatically turns the row green and then crosses it off. And again, that's using conditional formatting uh, to be able to do that. Not only that, but there's a spot over here for notes if they need to include like some proof that they completed that. Maybe that's where they put in, you know, a link to the evidence or something of completing that. And then also does a, a tally here at the top where it keeps track of what percentage of all of this they have completed. If you want to use something like this and don't feel like creating it from scratch, no worries. Right below here, you see a template. You can make a copy of this template. It's already got everything ready to go. It's got the conditional formatting built right into it. All you need to do is put in your own tasks or objectives. You or the students could do that. And then as you uh, check them off, it automatically, you know, fills in the color and crosses things off and does all that for you automatically. All right. Well, speaking of conditional formatting, uh, this brings us up to another uh, example here, which is conditional formatting feedback. All right, so what's this about? Well, the idea behind this is, what if we want to give our students a chance to um, test their knowledge, you know, before a, a quiz or a test that's coming up? We want them to have like a self-review activity. And again, you could create this, or this is something your students could create. Maybe this is a project where, hey, for this unit, I'm going to create, you know, this you know, self-assessment um, project and, you know, the student will, student will take, you know, questions from the unit and, and create this. Now, here's the idea behind it. 
what you can do is have a spreadsheet where you've got questions and then blanks over here where they'll type in an answer. Then using conditional formatting, if they type in the right answer, it could turn the cell green, for example. And if they type in the wrong answer, it could turn it red, for, for example. Or it could do a lot of things. I mean, that's very, very simple. Some folks have done a lot more creative things with it than that. But let me just show you an example. And then again, I have templates. You do not have to create this from scratch. You don't have to know. Technically, you don't have to know anything about conditional formatting. I will show you a little bit more about conditional formatting here in a second. But the point is, you don't have to know anything about it. You can just use the templates that we've got here. But here's the idea. So here I've got a, a Ohio trivia uh, example. If I click on this and make a copy, what you'll see is I have my questions here on the left and then a spot for my answers on the right. So let's say, you know, capital of Ohio, maybe I didn't know. And I go, well, Cleveland's a pretty big city. Maybe, you know, maybe it's Cleveland. And I type that in. Well, it just suddenly turned red because that's not the right answer. And I go, oh, well, I know Columbus is a pretty big city. Maybe it's Columbus. You know, and I put Columbus in and it turns green. Now, now how's it doing that? <laughs> well, basically, there is a hidden key. Um, and you can see this if you open up the template. So I've got a self-checking template here. And if you make a copy of the template, feel free to do this or have your students do this. Um, basically, this is what's going on in the background. There's a tab with the question. So here's where you type in your questions. And then there's a tab called key where you type in your answers. Aha. So like if I had a question that said, you know, something like, you know, uh, well, we'll do another one. We'll say, what was the original name for Google Sites. We'll do some more Google trivia here. How about that? Uh, and so if that was my question in the key. I could put in the correct answer, which so you can impress all these people, impress people with all your Google trivia. It was a, it was actually called Jotspot. That was the name of the product that Google turned into Google Sites. So you could put that in the key. Now, if they type in, you know, the correct answer, Jotspot, oop, there it is, shows up fine. If I typed in something else, if I didn't know, I said, well, maybe it was Weebly or something like that. You know, then it turns red. Now. You say, well, I don't want the students to see the key, obviously. So the directions here explain after you've typed in the questions and the key, then what you do is you hide the key tab. And you do that by clicking on the little arrow down here next to the key tab and then choosing hide sheet and boof, it gets hidden away. And so now you can just you know, start filling in the answers to the questions to see if you got it right or not. So just a, a helpful self-review, self-checking activity that uh, could be could be useful for students. Uh, folks have done some more creative things with it than that. I've got some links here to some done by some other awesome educators who you know did this with more of like a um, a, a picture reveal and, and, and different you know creative uses of it. Now, for what it's worth, I know I've just mentioned conditional formatting three times in a row here and haven't really explained it. I won't go into great, great, great depth with it, but just so that you have at least a comfort level with what is he talking about when he keeps mentioning conditional formatting. And again, you don't have to know how that works to use any of those activities. All those activities there, you can just make copies of the templates. But if you're like, no, 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 I would like to know. I actually do want to know how this is working. Uh, here's just a pretend spreadsheet of student data. These, this is not. Obviously, this is not real student data. This is just pretend data. But let me just show you what conditional formatting is. Basically, it's where you create rules that say if a cell contains certain data, I want you to, you know, color it red or color it green or make it bold or something like that. So let's say I wanted to look at all of my students' scores and go, you know what? I want to see anybody who has scored, you know, lower than a 70, you know, because I want to see maybe who's struggling and I'm, I'm want to be able to tell real quickly which students I need to intervene with. So the way this would work, the way conditional formatting works is you just take your mouse and select the data that you want to apply it to. In this case, I'm just grabbing all of these columns that have scores in it. And then what we're going to do is go up to our format menu. And from our format menu, we're going to choose conditional formatting. Now, when we do that, what it does is it opens up this panel where we get to set two things. One is what is the rule? And then what happens when something matches the rule? So for the rule, it just says at the moment, the cell is not empty. Well, that's not the rule I want. 
I want to have a more specific rule, and this feels a lot like filtering. So when you think back to filtering, same idea, creating a condition. So I could say, hmm, it could be, does it contain a certain you know, amount of text or a certain date, or nope, I'm talking about a numeric rule. I want to see anybody who's scoring less than or equal to a 70. So I'll choose less than or equal to, and I'll put in 70 for my cutoff value. Now that's the rule. Then below there is, well, what kind of formatting do you want? Do you want to make it bold or italicized or underlined? Or maybe I want to change the color. Maybe I want to say make it red if it's 70 or below. Now when I hit done, that conditional formatting rule has now been created. And so now I can very quickly see anybody who's scoring a 70 or below. And this is a live rule. If I went in and said, you know, this 68 actually wasn't a 68. I typed it wrong. It was a 78. Well, as soon as I press enter with a 78, it's no longer red. Or if I find out, oh, this, you know, you know, 75 was actually a 65. When I press enter, it's going to turn red. So that's what conditional formatting is, but it can be used in a lot of these creative ways. So you can use conditional formatting for things like the pixel art activity or the task checklist or the, you know, the feedback on whether you got a question right or wrong. So those are just some additional ideas on uh, how conditional formatting works. Okay, well guys, this brings us up to our last topic that um, I have uh, specifically uh, listed out here. Then there's a couple of additional resources I'll point you at. And so the last thing that I pulled out for ideas on how to use Google Spreadsheets in your classroom with your students would be tapping into Google's Applied Digital Skills. Now, if you're not familiar with this site, you gotta check it out. It's phenomenal. So Google's Applied Digital Skills is a collection of over 160, as of the time of this recording, who knows? <laughs> when you're watching this, it could be more, but 160 ready-to-use lessons that you can use in your classroom that are all hands-on, project-based activities. They all come with video tutorials, so the thing is, if you don't feel maybe as confident with some of these things, like, oh, this looks cool, but I'm not sure if I could teach students exactly how to do this with Google Sheets or whatever, no worries. It's already got the video tutorials ready for you to go. Uh, these are aimed at upper elementary through adult learners, so middle school, high school, adult, and upper elementary, and they're completely free. Um, and there's a bunch of them that deal with Google Sheets. Um, and I just, you know, pull out a couple examples here. If you take a look at the uh, agenda, you'll see it's, you know, using Google Sheets to make a study schedule or to organize group projects or to create a budget or to calculate probability, to explore mean, median, and mode, uh, to learn words in a new language, uh, to create a crossword puzzle, to uh, organize college information, so many possibilities. Now, here's the thing I would encourage you to do is, first of all, head on out to apply digital skills. Uh, all these links are in the agenda, of course, here. And from the Applied Digital Skills website, if you go to the Browse Lessons button, that's where you can see all of the uh, content, all the lessons. And it looks like at the moment we're at 166 lessons. You can then narrow it down by coming over to the left and choosing like the grade level or the tool that you want to focus in on. Uh, or the particular topic. So if you're looking for science-related activities or math activities or social studies or English language arts, you can go in and start narrowing these down. Um, once you do, though, and you find something that you're interested in, um, at that point, give a click on the uh, lesson and you'll see that it has all of the different um, videos ready to go. And the students will just work through these. So for each one of these, you know, give a click on this, there'll be a video to watch. You watch through the video. After you watch through the video, you hit next, move on to the next video. And they're short. They're like, you know, five minutes long at the most, you know, two, three, four, five minutes long. And they take the students step by step by step by step through what they need to do to complete that particular project. And so they're learning a tech skill while also working on uh, life skills, subject matter skills, um, career skills, things like that. So a lot of awesome ones that deal with Google Sheets. That would be a great way for well, you as well. These are good for, for adult learners as well. An awesome way for you to improve your uh, skills with Google Sheets and other Google project products as well.
And at that point, those are the key things I wanted to mention, but um, there is still more. Uh, so if you continue to scroll down in the document, there is a section called more activities. I'm not going to go into these, but these are just other ones I find over time that I uh, haven't broken out into their own section, but just kind of collected together. Some of these are ones I've created over time, but a lot of these are things other people have been very kind to share. And so a lot of these will link out to other people's blogs and templates, and I will keep adding more to this all the time. Anytime I come across more creative ideas for how to use Google Sheets in the classroom, I will keep adding more of these in there. So I would encourage you to uh, poke around and explore what you'll find under the more activities. All right, with all of that said, I do want to remind you that everything we just looked at here can always be found at the link bit.ly slash Kurtz dash sheets. That link will get you to the Google document that has all of these, you know, templates and training videos and uh, blog posts and links out to other resources that you can explore. And if you do have any questions, you can always contact me. My contact info is at the top there, uh, email and website and all that kind of stuff up there. So thank you so much for taking time to uh, learn along with me here. I hope this gave you a little bit more of a comfort level with Google Sheets, um, but also inspired you to realize that it's a very versatile tool that can be used in a lot of ways for student learning uh, in different grade levels and subject areas. So thanks again so much for being a part of this.